got, we have a Spanish translation. I'm not sure which uh, what the channel is, but there's there's Spanish translation here. Um, my name is, is Walter Earl, and I'm a visiting professor here at the Perry Center, the William J. Perry Center for uh, for Hemispheric Defense Studies. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, to this Hemispheric Forum. Um, Trinidad and Tobago will be uh, hosting the Conference of Defense Ministers of the Americas uh, in 2016, and uh, they've asked us, and we are honored to uh, arrange this uh, Hemispheric Forum to start to uh, discuss the, what will be the uh, thematic axes for discussion at, at the Hemispheric, at the uh, meeting of uh, defense ministers. This will be, 2016 will be the first time that uh, the Conference of Defense Ministers has been held in the Caribbean. Um, the, the conference has a distinguished history. Uh, it was uh, started in 1995 at uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, it uh, propagated a set of principles that sub subsequently formed the basis for the, um, for the Hemispheric uh, Security Declaration in 2003 of the OAS. And um, subsequently, uh, the conference was held in 1996 at Bariloche, Argentina, and it's been held every two years since then. Um, I'm going to introduce our guests from the government of, the, of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, they are the uh, leadership of the Se uh, Secretariat Pro Tempore for the, for the uh, Conference of Defense Ministers. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Carl Francis, who is the permanent secretary of the Ministry of National Security. He is a former uh, career diplomat uh, who's uh, served previously as the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Labor and in the office of the prime minister and, and uh, abroad in, uh, in Brussels and in uh, Washington. Uh, we also have uh, General Anthony Phillips Spencer, the Vice Chief of Defense Staff of the Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, who's had a military career of more than 34 years, in which he's served in a wide variety of assignments, uh, including uh, here as Defense Attaché and as the, uh, as the uh, uh, Chief of Delegation of uh, Trinidad and Tobago to the Inter-American Defense Board. And we have uh, Ms. Antoinette Lucas Andrews, who is the Director of the International Affairs Unit of the Ministry of National Security at Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and she uh, oversees the policy and program development in uh, fields including regional security, transnational organized crime, and migration, and uh, she's worked closely with the OAS uh, Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism, CICTE, since, uh, since 2007. And there's more information on our guests in uh, the program in, in their biographies. Uh, we also have um, a professor from the Perry Center, uh, Dr. Luis Bittencourt, um, who is, will provide uh, some commentary on the uh, themes uh, from an academic perspective. Dr. Bittencourt is a, uh, has been the deputy director and the, uh, and the um, Dean of Academic Affairs here at the Perry Center and has been a director, a professor, and a lecturer at a number of universities and institutes in the United States and in Brazil. Um, I'll mention what the themes are. Uh, the panelists, of course, will explain them. Uh, the first is, uh, the first proposed theme is the changing international defense and security environment and the evolving role of the military. The second proposed theme is environmental protection and resilience. And the third is hemispheric security and defense cooperation policy, a case for strengthened humanitarian emergency assistance. And let me just say a couple of words about the format uh, before we start. Um, this Hemispheric Forum is being broadcast by a live stream over the internet uh, with simultaneous interpretation. And um, we would like to welcome 
this broad audience to our hemispheric forum. Your participation is very important. I want to uh, recognize in particular uh, several groups. Uh, there's a group uh, in Jamaica of Perry Center alumni, military officers, and ministry officials who've gathered at the Jamaica Defense Force Conference Room, coordinated by Professor George Benson. There is a group of Perry Center alumni and uh, also members of the Consejo Ciudadano de Seguridad Pública of Jalisco in Guadalajara, Mexico. And there is a group gathered at, of uh, academic leaders at the Universidad Metropolitana de Paraguay, uh, including former Minister of Defense, Dr. Maria Liz Garcia de Arnold, and General uh, Victor Roa. Um, there are, I'm sure there are other groups as well, but those are the ones who, uh, who I've been uh, notified about. Um, this is an academic setting, uh, which means that um, the opinions expressed are those of the individuals speaking um, and uh, do not necessarily represent formal institutional positions, and particularly, um, uh, I do not speak for the, defense, the Department of Defense. Uh, so, um, uh, but we're asking you, the live audience and the audience on the internet, to please uh, uh, be prepared to uh, provide, uh, participate with questions and feedback because uh, uh, the government of Trinidad and Tobago looks at this as an opportunity to gather opinions and, and uh, start to form a consensus around the agenda for the conference. Uh, so uh, uh, feedback is very much encouraged. Um, the way we're going to do it is that uh, everybody in the live audience has gotten cards. And uh, please uh, put your uh, comments, questions on those cards. Um, we're going to have a short break. First, we're going to have the presentations uh, uh, by the, by the uh, Secretariat. Um, that'll run maybe 30 minutes or so. Then we'll have the academic commentary from Dr. Bittencourt for 10 minutes or so. And then we'll take a very short break, gather questions, gather the uh, input from the live chat, and uh, then uh, we'll dedicate the time to uh, uh, feedback and so on on those questions and, 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 and uh, issues and so on. Um, let me see. Uh, w one other thing, live audience, please write legibly. I'm not an expert at, at handwriting. Uh, so um, with that, let me, uh, let me turn the floor over to Permanent Secretary Francis uh, uh, to, to, to get this underway. I thank you, Professor Earl. And indeed, I want to say a very warm and hearty good afternoon to this very distinguished audience that is with us today. I also want to say good afternoon to our hemispheric audience that's following online. And we will seek to take you this afternoon on a journey, a journey that we have begun in Washington, D.C. this week. And that journey is a journey that takes up from where the hemisphere left off in October last year, when we had the 11th session of the Conference of Defense Ministers in Arequipa, Peru. And out of that meeting, we, a few months, a couple months afterwards, were handed over the chairmanship by Peru. They, they did indeed come to Port of Spain to do that. And since then, we have been seeking to find a way, a mechanism, to make this 12th conference one of a difference, seeking to find a mechanism to ensure that the hemisphere understands the fundamentals of change that's sweeping the world and indeed sweeping the hemisphere. And so with that in mind, we are the view that we have to make this conference one that responds to the international imperative, responds to the challenges that we are facing so that we can bring meaningful responses, meaningful solutions for the benefit of our peoples. Now, we have started a process, and this week in Washington, D.C., we have begun a number of meetings, bilateral meetings, meeting with departments of the U.S. government, meetings with regional groups, because our intention is to massage this thing to the point where, when we get to Port of Spain in October, the hemisphere will have some degree of consensus on the issues. 
I hasten to add that we are not going towards this process with blinkers. We are aware of the fact that there are various views, varying views and issues that we are going to put on the table. But we are confident that in true Caribbean style, we can bring some degree of balance, some degree of, 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 of analysis that contributes to consensus as you go forward. And that being the case, we have decided that we will have subsequent to this week's activities, a technical group meeting in Port of Spain, where a number of academics and others will come to Port of Spain and discuss the issues, the three themes that we have put on the table. Subsequent to that, we are going to be having the normal prep session in which we will seek to advance the declaration for the conference and get past any stumbling blocks that we uh, see or try to get past stumbling blocks in March in the prep session. Of course, and prepare the normal administrative arrangements for the conference in October. And between March and October, we will be in a process of massaging, of dialogue, etc., as we treat with the issues we have put on the table and get them moving forward. So this afternoon, we begin the dialogue. And if you'd forgive me, we're going to take a tag team approach to treating with the issues that we have on the table. And I would then wish to, with these very few remarks, I will stop here and ask my colleague to take us further. Before I do that, I want to say that this whole process is buttressed on the, the CDMA, CDMA regulations, which is in itself, or in themselves, are buttressed on the Williamsburg principles that came out of that first CDMA meeting in 1995. And indeed, there are, there are, there's a, if I may just get this moving. Article 2 of the regulations of the CDMA says, the sole purpose of the Conference of Ministers of Defense of the Americas is to foster mutual knowledge, analysis, debate, and exchange of ideas and experiences on defense and security measures. And it goes on to say, Expected results are to increase cooperation and integration and to contribute from a defense and security planning perspective to the development of member states. And that is still our purpose. We bring this, this expectation to the current reality and we, we, we apply all of the dynamics that we, have, we are going to talk about this afternoon to ensuring that our peoples in the hemisphere find meaningful solutions to the issues that plague us. So having said that, I will ask my colleague to begin to take us through the presentation. I shall return a bit later. Pleasant good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to particularly recognize the distinguished audience here at the Perry Center and at the NDU and to say hello to the guys back in Jamaica and Paraguay and Mexico. Um, so, Permanent Secretary Francis outlined where we began. We started with a focus on purpose and intent and the CDMA regulations are very clear. What, what I will now do is just provide a quick overview of the general context. What were the things that informed our consideration of the themes that we would want to present for this dialogue as we prepare for the 12 CDMA? And one of the first things you note on that slide, which is up now, is that there clearly is a shift in the global security environment that has occurred post the Cold War. And guess what? The CDMA process began in 1995, and therefore, certainly we sense, is meant to respond to that changing security environment. But what we've also been able to identify is that th that environment, that shift, is really anchored or pillared on two major thrusts. One is a thrust for the protection of human rights, and so we know the, the discussion on R2P, and the other is on the provision of humanitarian assistance. And it's not that that shift has sought to exclude the concept of security of the state. What has happened is that it has now emphasized in a way that it did not before the whole issue of human security, and so it has added the new and non-traditional imperatives of transnationality, and multidimensionality to what we traditionally would have been focused on by way of, so of sovereignty. Apart from that, the post-Cold War concept of the protection of human rights 
which includes a focus on the protection of people from a very broad range of crimes, genocide and all those crimes against humanity. And more specifically, when we speak of the responsibility to protect, we also need to remember that there's an apportionment of responsibility to states as well to take collective action. And the exact language speaks of taking appropriate diplomatic humanity and, uh, and other means to protect populations, and it speaks of crimes. But we want to apply that same imperative for collective action on the human rights side to the need for collective action on the humanitarian assistance side. And so we note that post-Cold War, there is also the creation of a whole new international institutional governance framework to deal with the issue of humanitarian assistance. Therefore, in 1998, where the Office of the Commissioner for Humanitarian Assistance was established at the United Nations, it signaled that more and more we had entered into a period where the military, what would have been used by way of um, or defense establishments in the past for the traditional type rules was now being increasingly called forward to assist in humanitarian type assistance. Now, for that reason, as we go forward, we have anchored our themes more on the concerns with humanitarian assistance. This hemisphere was way ahead in terms of dealing with human rights. In 1959, yes, in this same hemisphere, we established the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. And then 20 years later, we established the court. At the UN, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was only established in 1993, post the Cold War. So we sense that this hemisphere is probably on the right track, we have already begun to establish the institutional arrangements to deal with the human rights side. This hemisphere is lagging though behind all other regions in the world in terms of organizing itself to deal with humanitarian assistance. We are lagging at a time when increasingly we are being required to take collective action to provide humanitarian assistance. and. As the increasing demand has arisen, our military or defense establishments are being repeatedly and increasingly thrust into the delivery and provision of humanitarian assistance. That is what we see as the problem. The problem is that the hemisphere is not organized to respond to the provision of humanitarian assistance. The environment is becoming higher in terms of its intensity and regularity to call for to our defense establishments, and we have no, po uh, no policy framework to govern how we will employ our military establishments there. Um, and so in that context, the, role of, the traditional role of the defense establishments is being redefined. Countries where before you would not have your defense or military establishments tasked for certain missions, you don't have a choice now. In the small island states in the Caribbean, we don't have a choice. And so, as we go forward, our themes Yes. So, yeah. My apologies. Yeah. So, so our themes are really these three. And if you want to understand the flow and how the three themes are connected, the first theme is really a dis meant to be a descriptive discussion to allow for full exchange of the experiences and practices that occur now in the hemisphere. All member states do something in terms of how we um, employ our military, but clearly that role is evolving, and so the first theme will describe and give us an opportunity to share our practices and experiences. The second theme, though, is, okay, so let's select a specific context, environmental protection and resilience, and let's analyze how our military 
and defense establishments have been functioning, responding, evolving in discharging that role. And the third team is really an attempt at, at what we call a prescriptive discussion to hopefully initiate the leadership process by the CDMA to fix the problem. The problem is that there is a gap or deficiency in the Americas as a region with respect to the cooperation policy to govern the provision of humanitarian assistance, including the role of the defense sector and the employment of the military. That's the problem. To fix the gap or deficiency in the Americas as a region with respect to a cooperation policy to govern the provision of humanitarian assistance, which specifically we are concerned with relates to the role of the defense sector and the employment of the military. At this point, I'd like to continue our tag team approach and hand over to Ms. Antoinette Lucas-Andrews, who will take us through the first thematic axis. Antoinette. Thank you very much, John. And a pleasant good evening to our audience, both in-house and those that are online. So I have the responsibility today to share with you our concept behind the thematic axis, the first thematic axis, the changing international defense and security environment, the evolving role of the military. Now essentially, what is the purpose for proposing this thematic axis? And it's really for member states and the CDME to recognize the evolving role of the military in supporting public security in a number of countries across the hemisphere. And this, this, this purpose is set in the context of developments which have redefined, the, redefined sorry, the concept of security as multidimensional in nature. The Declaration of Bridgetown recognized that security threats, concerns, and other challenges in the hemisphere, in the hemispheric context, sorry, are of a diverse nature. Article 2 of the Declaration of Security in the Americas also recognized the multidimensional nature of security. The fact that the threats that we are faced with are both traditional and non traditional. The very Williamsburg principles upon which the CDMA is based acknowledge that the military and the security forces play a critical role in supporting and defending the legitimate interests of our sovereign democratic states. So it is in that context, the, nature, the multidimensional approach, that we've recognized that we need to look at this theme. We want to initiate discourse and to continue where, where such discourse has not been initiated and how both arms of our security and defense sectors can work together, how the military continue, can continue to be an aid to civil power and civil authority. And in doing so, we've recognized the need that such an approach must be integrated and coordinated. Now, we can all agree that there are some priority concerns that are facing all of us in the hemisphere. We chose to identify just a few. Issue of transnational organized crime, including drug trafficking and drug interdiction, continue to confront us, and particularly for some of the states in the Caribbean, which are often used as transit states. Major event security, when we have to host a major event, it's a reality that all of our countries face. How do, we, how do we protect our critical infrastructure? How do we secure our, our, our cyber space? And how do we work together in respect of humanitarian assistance and disaster response? These are just some of the priority concerns that we've identified. But we had to look at the reality of the 
architecture in which we all operate. Our hemisphere, the member states of the CDMA, do not belong to homogeneous grouping. We're not homogeneous in terms of geography, in terms of size, in terms of national priorities, in terms of economic status, in terms of the state of our resources. That's a fact. The very CDMA regulations in Article 2 accepts the principle of diversity within the region. The essential acceptance of differing points of views, perceptions, and concepts stemming from a broad array of cultural, social, and language factors. These differences, however, should not hinder the promotion of our common interests in a spirit of cooperation and, co and collaboration. But these differences should complement them. Not all states have a Ministry of Defense. We know that. While there is the existence of defense institutions in some states, some don't. Even the relationship that exists in those countries where there are defense institutions, even the relationship between those defense institutions and civil or public security law enforcement type institutions, those relationships range from a point of distinct to a point of non-existent, perhaps. Indeed, some states maintain independence, total, complete independence, between the defense sector and the public security institutions. While in other states, the military continues to act as an aid to civil power. There are also differing frameworks differing legislative and other frame, institutional frameworks regarding joint efforts and actions that are to be undertaken between the military and the civil authorities. That is our reality. Those are our differences. But here are some areas where we can find common ground, where we can find commonality. And as such, under this thematic axis, these are some of the areas we propose to engage in discussions on. The evolving role of the military in providing major event security. The evolving role of the military in countering transnational organized crime, whether it be maritime, narco-trafficking, human smuggling, human trafficking, cyber threats, or the evolving role of the military in response to natural disasters. With respect to major event security, we recognize that the military can provide support in the planning and the execution of major event security. That is any major sport, any major political or cultural event of an international, international dimension. We have examples of it in the region. In the Caribbean, in 2007, countries of the region came together, created a single domestic space, and established a joint international, I should say multinational task force comprising members of the military from some of our member states in support of, of the security arrangements for the Cricket World Cup. Brazil has the example recently last year in hosting the World Cup and again it will be demonstrated next year in respect of, of the Olympics. And there's another way in which the military can provide support, specialist type support. Specialist support that, specialist things that myself as a, as a normal civilian person have no clue about. But I'm sure many of you in this room are quite familiar with those specialist areas. And the issue of transnational organized crime. The hemisphere contributes 50%. A UN report, the UN um, estimates annual drug revenue in the Americas at US $150 billion. 
or just under half of the global total, almost 50% of the total amount in trade. However, our history has demonstrated that our air and our naval forces can play a crucial role in countering maritime narco-trafficking. In addressing migrant smuggling, human trafficking, and piracy. I just saw something there, but... Um, and finally, there's also a role in respect of how we protect our cyberspace. Where there's required, do we need to de um, develop cyber defense strategies or cyber defense policies? With respect to disaster response, it's a reality that all of our countries face. This morning, my permanent secretary in addressing the OAS Committee on Hemis Hemispheric Security spoke about the examples that we have, we have all encountered recently in, in the Bahamas, in Dominica, in Guatemala, um, in the United States. We are faced with, with, these, with these natural disasters. These, are, these can create shocks that can derail the growth trajectory of a country. And even within the International Humanitarian Assistance Framework, there's a requirement for additional resources. There's a requirement for, for structuring. There's a requirement for coordination. And this is another way in which the military can provide support. These are the three broad areas that, 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 that we have identified as sub-themes under thematic access one. And we have a number of expected outcomes, and I'm saying expected because we're not seeing what, that these are the outcomes. We are proposing them as possible outcomes, and it's open to discussions. That with respect to major event security, what we hope to see is practical and expedient defense cooperation in the development of our security policies for the protection of major events. And the development of guidelines were required for a civil military approach to securing major events. In the area of transnational organized crime, enhanced coordination and collaboration in respect of joint uh, multinational operations. With respect to disaster relief, some possible outcomes information sharing mechanisms to guide our strategic policy and operational approaches. And perhaps a strategic guide on avenues and mechanisms for collaboration, which will include best practices and lessons learned. So this is the concept of thematic access one. And I want to turn over to my permanent secretary, who will talk about thematic access two. Thank you, Antoinette. Uh, colleagues, what we have been trying to do, what we have demonstrated in the first access, is the fact that to show that there have been changes uh, internationally and that these changes will impact our hemisphere and that we have to have a response. And indeed, as we go towards the second axis, we are moving into uh, new areas of thinking, in addition to what has been said before. We are looking at areas in which we have not focused sufficiently before and which we need to focus as we go forward. And so thematic access to treats with the issue of environmental protection and resilience. The purpose of the access is to consider the role that the military can play in, in environmental protection and resilience. Now, we, we see this from a three-pronged perspective. We have been observing, of course, all of us are aware of climate change and the effects of climate change. And we need to bring to the table the impact that this could have on the military in the hemisphere. We need to also analyze how the military in the hemisphere can help with the various uh, effects of climate change, help to mitigate these effects. And of course, the third prong is to examine how the military itself can impact the environment. So this three-prong approach will seek to have a discussion and so facilitate and engender collaboration and a functional cooperation sense of, sense of course as to how the military can, can exist in this way 
can impact and can be impacted. On the 20th of October 2003, the OAS adopted the Declaration on Security in the Americas, and it established that environmental deterioration affects the quality of life of our peoples and may constitute a threat, a concern, or challenge to the security of states in the hemisphere. And through this declaration, the OAS, the Organization Secretariat for Multidimensional Security, called for action by all member states to strengthen our national cap capabilities in the face of environmental degradation. And in considering this, in the 11th Conference of Defense Ministers of the Americas, the 11th CDMA, it was agreed to promote within the legal framework of each country and respecting national sovereignty, and I, I, I stress that, respecting national sovereignty, the exchange of experience in environmental best practice applicable to the defense sector, including eventual consequences of climate change, as well as specialized training and knowledge exchange. So in both the CDMA and the OAS OS process as well, there has been a recognition. We are seeking to take this a step further and bring it to some stage of implementation in the CDMA. Now, as we, as we move forward, we look as well at the decision of the CDMA where we said that there was agreement to do what I just described. And we also appreciate that in every area of the hemisphere, in Central America, in South America, in the Caribbean, and in North America, we have been observing the debilitating effects of climate change. What does this mean for the military? It means that without some kind of remediation as to what has been happening, the usability to coin a phrase and deliverability of military bases and facilities may be affected. It means that there may be threats to, to the health of the forces because as things get generated because of changing climate and changing climatic conditions, we have to now do new renewed research. We have to see what the impact, what impacts there are on forces. We have to see in some way how we can mitigate these effects, but through a collective approach. This is one area we think that does not uh, impact or inform or involve state-to-state somatic uh, interactions, but paves the way for us to find a mechanism to treat with the impact of climate change on our forces. As I mentioned at the outset, we also look at the way the forces can be much more involved in treating with the effects of climate change. My colleague spoke this morning, a while ago, sorry, about the, the impact that could be caused by environmental responses in terms, of, in terms of disaster, disaster preparedness. And when my colleague speaks about item three, thematic item three, he will go further into that. But we are seeing already that climate change is engendering a greater role for this tremendous resource that we have in hemisphere to be used effectively to mitigate the effects on our populations. So we are, this is a prime example where the environmental changes that are taking place that are taking place internationally and impacting our hemisphere has an impact on the military. And then I want to say quickly that, as I said in the beginning, we must not fail to recognize as well that the military itself can have a negative impact on the, on the climate situation that, it, that affects us. We have been looking at the issue of military readiness, readiness and resilience. And we look at the issues, as I mentioned, of the degradation of the capacity of military organizations and personnel to execute their core missions. There will be a diminished ability to support states during times of disaster, and we are positing that a key role of the military will be to support states in times of disaster. And there will be an increase in the frequency, scale, and complexity of future missions, including the defense support to civil authorities, which we feel is a thing of the current situation and it cannot be avoided. And of course, we also recognize that there will be an undermining of the capacity of domestic installations to support training activities and other activities of the military. What do we expect from all of this? We expect that there will be a consensus on strategic interventions across the hemisphere that can be made to increase the resilience of military installations and help mitigate these environmental effects. We expect also there will be a development of an appropriate research, of appropriate research and meaningful collaboration to solve these issues. We know that there will be an impact on the resources of states as the militaries are called upon 
to treat with the issue of the health and the protection of health through insurance and other mechanisms of the members who are serving with them. And so we try, we will have to try our best to come together to provide workable solutions to issues that affect us across the board. This is not about state, it's not about sector, it's about country, and it's about safety of our military personnel as we go forward. So in a, in, as a, in a brief synopsis, we are recognizing that as we change the dynamic, as we change the speak in the hemisphere, we have to come to reali the realization that we cannot treat the military as an isolated block that is just there to fight a war if it were to arise. But we have to take this extremely resu uh, important resource, this extremely qualified resource and capable resource, and put it to use. In my own country, we spend a tremendous amount of money on our military, as small as we are. We've just passed our national budget, and the Ministry of National Security got the largest chunk of that national budget a couple of days ago. And this is to support the, the fight against crime, etc. but it's also to support the Defense Force of Trinidad and Tobago. And we don't intend to simply have the Defense Force wait for a, a physical activity, an interaction with another state. We don't expect to have any wars in the Caribbean. But we have begun to use the Defense Force to assist our young people. We have begun to use the Defense Force to treat with a number of issues. And so the issue of environment is critical. And we say that we must examine these issues as we go forward. And we call upon you, our colleagues, to help us carry this process forward. I thank you very much. I call on my colleague now to treat with one of the most important elements of our, of our presentation, and this is thematic access three. Brigadier. Thank you very much, Permanent Secretary. I just promised our moderator that I'll try to run a fast final leg. Um, I probably could do some help from the team listening in Jamaica. So I'm at thematic access three. And I spoke in the introduction that the first team described the second team in a specific context, analyzed, and so let's look at some prescription. Let's, let's, let's have a prescriptive discussion. Yeah. So the purpose of this team is that we want to begin the discussion on fixing the problem. Take your minds back to my brief explanation of the problem. We need a regional or hemispheric cooperation policy. We're also saying that there's clear benefit of doing that, and we're focusing specifically on the area of strengthened humanitarian emergency assistance. And as I go ahead quickly, you will understand why we zero in on humanitarian emergency assistance and not the broad spectrum of of humanitarian assistance. A quick review of the background. The environment has changed. There's increased reliance on the military. There's increased demand for the military and the defense sector to become involved in these emerging um, emergent, um, humanitarian emergency assistance events and requirements. We do not have in this region, we're the only one, we absent in terms of our overarching regional cooperation policy. So let's take a quick look on this table at what's happening in the world post the Cold War. So at the UN level, I spoke earlier that in 1993, they established the, of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, but they also established in 1998 the Office for the Commission on Humanitarian Assistance. In ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, they had a discussion that began in 1996, and in November 2004, in fact, November the 29th, 2004, the ASEAN heads agreed to implement the ASEAN Community Plan of Action. On the 26th of December, 2004, we might recall that there was a huge tsunami. The decision had been taken, it had not yet been implemented. So in that tsunami event, the region had to rely on the international community from outside of the region to respond and recover. Of course, the history is that post-2006, uh, when ASEAN was able to implement this plan of action, they have since been able to do much better at responding within the region from their own arrangements and own military and defense sectors to events that have occurred. 
um, take your mind back to the incident of that first aircraft that went missing. And so you would recall that you would see the media coverage of several uh, generals and admirals from military forces across the ASEAN member states. They had responded on their own on the basis of this plan of action. Let's take a look at the AU, the African Union. They also took some time to decide how it would um, roll out for their context. Each of these arrangements have been designed to suit the peculiarities of the region. So in our case, we would also have to do the same. So they took six years. In 1997, the African Chiefs of Defense Staff Conference put forward a proposal, a framework for action to the it was then the Organization of African Unity. At the point where they transitioned to the AU in 2002, in 2003, right after, they established a common African defense and security policy. And you might notice, if you go to the research, I don't have time now to tell you all about it, but if you do the research, you'll realize that they now have sub-regional arrangements as all, all as part of an African standby force and a military staff committee. The EU was um, also in this discussion between 93 and 1999, six year period. 1999, they established the European Common Security and Defense Policy. But by 2009, the Lisbon Treaty, they changed it to the Common Security and Defense Policy. And in a subsequent slide, you would understand what what they have done as a result. I'm going to keep going forward. Um, you see some question marks in the Americas there. I have proposed that the appropriate forum and authority is the CDMA. And as I go forward, you'll see where we begin to prescribe what we could probably do to remove those question marks. Um, quick snapshot of what has been achieved in ASEAN. So in May 2006, so the, the decision was taken in November 2004, but the the first meeting of the ASEAN defense ministers was in May 2006. Since then, ASEAN has adopted a number of concept papers that they have moved to implement. These are just three. One of those there related to the establishment of an ASEAN Center of Military Medicine might remind you that last year, one of the themes, the thematic axes at CDMA 11 was the whole issue of military medical health. They have implemented this center, and so they've moved ahead. I promise to run a fast leg, so let's look at the AU. A quick glance at some of their achievements, and I'll go to the last bullet. So there was an outbreak of the EVD, Ebola virus disease, in 2014. And so the Peace and Security Council of the AU authorized the deployment of an AU-led military, civilian, and humanitarian mission. It's, it, it was called the AU support to Ebola outbreak in West Africa. They responded. They had a framework, a policy, a cooperation policy based on which they were able to respond. Um, so quick look at what's happening in the EU. Um, so 1999, the ESDP is established. 2004, they meet and they create some military headline goals, including the commitment to establish, to form 13 EU battle groups and to keep two on standby. 2009, the environment is still changing further, so it's no longer the European security and defense policy, it's the common security and defense policy, Treaty of Lisbon, and they add some new tasks. Included in those three new tasks is the responsibility for humanitarian and rescue missions. Let's take a quick look at what's happening in our region. So we don't have the overarching cooperation policy, so I had to come up with some approximate achievements. Yes? What are we doing that looks like similar achievements? So in 1991, that's before any of the other regions seem to have begun their discussion, we adopted the Inter-American Convention to facilitate disaster assistance. But then I reflected on an article that Ambassador Enaudi, uh, 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 Luigi Enaudi, wrote in 2007, Trans-American Security, What's Missing? 
And so even though we had an early start in terms of the discussion in 1991, we had a long, we have had a long drag, and therefore we're now in a case where we're facing a troubling lag behind the other regions in terms of establishing our policy. That convention, the Inter-American Convention, entered into force in 1996. Today, there are four countries, four member states in the region that have ratified two that have access. Six countries in all have paid attention to that convention. Ambassador Inaudi proposed that what was missing in the trans-American security environment is implementation. Um, there have been several OAS General Assembly resolutions continuing to try and move us forward. We haven't come to the point where we fix the problem. So, this says current status, uh, sorry, um, the slide should have been changed. It's a 2005 outlook on the problem in the Americas. This is a statement extracted from a report by the Committee on Hemispheric Security in May of 2005. It was submitted to the Permanent Council. The Permanent Council took it forward to the, to the OAS General Assembly. And so we had another spurt of a start on the concern but we haven't completed the journey. Note, this is not a problem that has existed now. Ten years ago, it was attracting the attention of the Committee on Hemispheric Security. So, do I need to say anything more about this slide? The rationale is clear. There's an increasing requirement for this collective response to humanitarian emergency assistance. The military and the defense sector is the first place you call. All member states are doing it. I'd, I'd, I'd love to know which country, which member state in the region is not calling the military when there is a requirement for humanitarian emergency assistance. We think that the CDMA, CDMA 12, is the appropriate forum. It's timely. This is an overdue requirement. And so we think that um, we should begin the exchange of ideas, start our discussion. So as I complete, we're thinking about prescribing. Let's put ourselves, you know, you have to govern your thought. We're talking cooperation policy, not cooperation strategy. Policy governs, strategy guides. We want when we implement a framework that there's governance. So it's not that it's left to happen anyhow. Things have been left to happen anyhow so far, and we've not done so well. So we're focusing on cooperation policy. Second, this is about military assistance. We, this is not a military alliance. And I'll leave that for discussion and questions in case someone wants to understand why we are thinking about this, but we think we are sensitive to the realities of our region. We're dealing with humanitarian emergency assistance, not the full spectrum of humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian assistance, the, the ICRC and NGOs, they do a great job. Médecins Sans Frontières, they do a great job at some elements of that humanitarian assistance spectrum. We're not talking about the defense sector getting involved there. Maybe to work with them. Um, so what's the scope we propose and some guiding principles? Well, let's, let's, let's focus on humanitarian emergency assistance to start the discussion towards developing, finally, our region's cooperation policy. Um, the earlier presentations signal this, so no surprise. Let's focus on disaster response. Let's so focus on search and rescue. That was a mandate from the 11th CDMA. So we just had a working group meeting in Port of Spain in August where we've put forward a framework for action, a five-point framework for action. That could also be rolled into the early stages of the discussion on how we develop the policy. And the Permanent Secretary um, referred to the issue of environmental protection. So, right here in the United States, um, maritime oil spill pollution, major events that require collective responses to preserve well, to um, 
to protect the environment. All of these things, all military establishments and the defense sector gets called to become involved in. Oops. So, I have the text here, so that's good. Let's see if I... No, it's not animated. So, what are the, the expected outcomes? One, we think that if we succeed in initiating the discussion towards establishing, creating a hemispheric security and defense cooperation policy, we will achieve improved efficiency and effectiveness in the provision of humanitarian emergency assistance in the Americas. So our response in Haiti in January 2010, which wasn't good, the response from countries outside of this region was more effective and efficient than countries inside this region. Fortunately, Brazil was on the ground as part of leading minister in Haiti, and so they saved the region's face. Um, there were challenges with countries in this region getting their own military past the airport. So I'll stop there on that point. And finally, we think that it's time at CDMA 12 to agree on an agenda that the CDMA is the appropriate forum to provide leadership for the development of a hemispheric security and defense cooperation policy. I don't think there is a more appropriate, authoritative forum where this discussion should begin. CDMA sits between the heads, so when the CDMA ministers agree, they inform the heads, this is a good idea, the heads say, good idea, the political will comes. When the CDMA ministers agree, technical and policy level gets cranked up, and we get the job done. So. Thank you very much for your attention, and I now hand over to Professor Bitenku, who I know is standing by to offer some comments at the end of the presentation. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. The wine was fair. The food was not so good. I'm talking about Williamsburg, 1995. The setting was fantastic. Historical town, Williamsburg. Actually, we owe a lot to Rockefeller because he was the one who provided the reconstruction of those nice setting. Very historical. I think the, the food was not so great because there is this British heritage there that we try to respect. And still, if you go to a tavern there, uh, there's a lot of this. The ideas that came in those days were extraordinary. 20 years ago, extraordinary. Considering the times that we were living in the region, the initiative was really unexpected. It's not that it was easy. If you remember before that, President Clinton had submitted the idea of Summit of the Americas. So there was this spirit of Miami coming in that town. Just to remind you, the three topics recommended suggest in that conference were the armed forces and the 21st democracies, defense cooperation, transparency in military tasks. If we look at the topics presented today, we are still talking about what's going to be the military defense in the 21st century and the relationship with democracies. The good news is that we do have democracies. Well, what quality of democracy we have is a different question, but for us to think carefully on that. In those days, we were really concerned about the role of the military in relationship with civilians and political power and the prospects of military coming back to control political power in the new democracies in the region. So that's why this topic was particularly important. But also was a topic that created lots of uh, internal conversations in those buildings there in Williamsburg and Sotto Voce, this 
lower voice and what are the Americans trying to do with that? What is the agenda behind that? What's the hidden agenda coming from that? So conspiracies were all around. And unfortunately, I have to share with you, if you look at the, all the other conferences, unfortunately, we did not progress too much in that. And this is the challenge that you refer from the beginning, that you want to be of this conference a mark. And the mark could be in this sense, because you just mentioned here some very good ideas in the way we could push forward those talks that are roughly of the common consensus. Who is against it having some sort of cooperative protocols to help us produce humanitarian assistance quickly and effectively to the, to the region that's affected by that? Who is against that? But be aware that right now, some participants in this conference have already their talking points ready. Have already, the, regardless the topics that we present to the discussion, their speeches are prepared. Because they have, they have turned this conference as opposed to a cooperative opportunity for these top level authorities and defense establishments in the region as just a podium to present old ideas. And so I think it's time, as you quite mentioned in, in your key points, to use this, to try to use this opportunity, to try to change this mindset and remind people that this was not this type of idea, this, the idea of the conference, the process was not really designed to create or to expose the differences in the region. We all know that we have difference. And this is one of the quality of the papers that I want to underscore here. The, the, the three proposals, I think, are quite realistic. They are quite sensitive to the region. I confess to my friends here that this was kind of a surprise to me because I would expect more concern with your own region, it's natural, and with your own strategic environment, which is natural in, in considering the reality that we face. But you reveal quite a broad concern with how can you be helpful in this conference for the entire region. This is a, a quality in the presentation that I noticed. They reveal also a tremendous perception on specific sensitivities in the region. Allow me to mention one, because it's, I think, roughly known, the distinction between security and defense, in which for some countries in the region, and I apologize to mention Mexico, it's very little difference because of the, re the reality that you live there. And then using military, sometimes in domestic issues, is part of the Constitution. And this is your reality, your political culture that is demanding for that. But we have others in the region, and I'm sorry to mention Argentina, in which the distinction in, upon those two concepts is quite fundamental. So how can we think about a conference that is for the hemisphere that does not respect those political realities. So we are not there to correct distinct visions that we have. This conference is exactly to try to respect those points and see how can we broadly can create common tools to work together. And this is, in my view, a critique, a critique that us as an academic would make to the approaches that we had here. It's not only common to those approaches here, it's common to other opportunities that we see in the region. Uh, and the critique is that uh, I wish, and I wish the conference will address that. It's not only about each country doing whatever they can to address those topics individually as individual countries. But it is us how we recognize that we are in a common strategic environment, could think about common initiatives, sometimes bilateral, sometimes trilateral, sometimes from the countries living in the region. How can we address those specific issues? In a region that, to pick one of the talks, environment, we have all types of environment in our region. Going to the Arctic, to the Amazon forest, to the rainforest, to dry lands, to elevations, we have all kinds of climate in the region. So one change in the climate environment will affect differently all kinds of countries in the region. How can we think together about those issues? 
There are some initiatives in the region that we cannot ignore. The Amazonian countries are doing events, meeting with the natural difficulties that we have, recognize that we will have to think together about that. Uh, there are some initiatives that are positive, but I believe that the conference would do, this particular conference in Trinidad and Tobago, would do a great service to, for the regions if it could break this mold in which we are there to defend their points, as opposed to how can we think together about this common regional environment and produce some things together. This affects the environment. If we compare the, the three tops of the current proposal, and as I said, don't be, don't be disappointed because we will have there some countries already with their remarks ready and prepared and will not change. Uh, however, if you look at the, the first one, and if you look at it now, regardless, uh, if we put aside the environment which was not so present in the first one, the others are not so different. What I think we could also rethink, and this is in the paper, when we talk about the evolving role of the military, but if you look carefully at the history, it's not so evolving. This is what the military have been doing forever. It's perhaps an acceptation that uh, military have subsidiary roles that in every country they have to, to perform because they are the first one that are able to reach a region that has been affected by humanitarian disasters and things. But what we do think that the conference could help is about creating mechanisms to create this exchange of experiences as a natural thing. We do have here, I believe today is the last day of the Tides, the Star Tides program, which is quite an interesting program that uh, I unfortunately see very little, uh, very little uh, attendance or, or advertisement of that. But there is a tremendous effort here in the university that has been doing for a long time in inviting companies to develop specific equipments that could help countries suffering humanitarian disasters that could be simple in the, in the utilization, that could be easy to manipulate, because if you do have a hospital that could be performed, but you only need the highly sophisticated people to put that together, then you don't have, you have the hospital, but you, but you don't have the highly sophisticated people, so you don't have that. So this program is quite interesting. It's something that I believe I would like to be more shared with people, with countries from the region, I think would be quite useful. So I, I believe that the, the three points, the three talks are good, they are excellent, they are talks of a common interest for the entire region. If we uh, look at the other conferences before that, I think we come quickly to the conclusion that we are not addressing the most critical issues in defense in the region or in defense and security in the region. And there is a reason for that that we try to water down so much the topic so that nobody will be offended or that we can create consensus, that in the end we don't address anything. And then we leave the conference and we say that, well, I lost my time, I wasted my time. Nothing really important happened. We did not get to any important decisions. So I think it's the time and to really put those topics to work. And the initiative that doing and trying to expose this to the discussion is quite extraordinary and good and positive. We do have here in this town and in the region institutions that can help to put more debate, more discussion that which will be effective. If we can make of those talks some things that we can really think together how we can produce important tools. Some promises, if you go to backwards and you look at the other conferences, and you look at the talks, the promises, and you see carefully what, were, what was accomplished, then you get disappointed. Well, we did not accomplish many, many things. Or many of the promises just remain as the promise that you do, we do at the New Year's Eve. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I've been promising that for the last 10 years. And nothing happened then. Is this conference bad in a sense? I would say no. Look back, as I said, bad democracies, democracies in evolution, fine. And then we criticize, sometimes we criticize, in, we criticize the, the liberal blancos. 
or we criticize the defense establishments or the defense ministers. Well, they are not really civilian power. Yes, it's true. But put that in perspective. Livros Blancos are sort of white books as a product. You look at some of them and say, well, there is nothing there quite bad. But remember of the process. So many things are more important because of the process. And we are trying to analyze this, assess the thing. I think we must have this strategic vision perspective. Many things are more important because of the process than because of the product that you have. The conference, if we look back, we did not conclude many of the promises that were made, but the process was truly exceptional. And maybe it's because of this process that we have in our region. We may have many complaints, but compare our region to what's happening in some other regions of the world. Look at that, look around, and I think we have reasons to be happy. And let me recover here, if, if I can find here in my notes, something that was said in 1995, September 13 by then President Clinton. Future generations will look back on the Defense Ministerial Conference as an exciting new chapter in regional relations and a milestone in the cause of hemispheric peace. I do think that this is happening. If we look back, we may be very critical to the process. But I do believe that this forthcoming conference, because of the commitments that I saw here today and the commitments of the Trinidad and Tobago, will be a milestone that we will be all proud of having participated in that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Bittencourt, and thank you, panelists. L let's give a round of applause. I think these are very interesting. What we, what we received. So we're going to take a very short break now to collect questions and comments. Um, if the live audience would write comments, questions on the cards that you've been given and pass them to the center aisle, we'll pick them up. And uh, if I could get any uh, input from the live chat that's been coming in from the internet, if someone could bring bring me that down, and we'll just in a couple of minutes we'll start we'll start again. And I'm going to talk to our. Um, our panelists about the possibility of making available the slides that we've seen. I think they were very substantive. There was a lot there. There was a lot to digest, and uh, I think that'd be useful. So, take take a minute to write questions, and, and we'll start.
Ladies and gentlemen, if I could invite you to return to your seats. The plane is about to take off. return to your seats so we can uh, start the uh, question and discussion period. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I have to warn you. There is a laser beam that will be burning everybody who is standing. Yes. I think it's work, Walter. Yes, good work. Now that's your uh, microphone. Ah, okay. All right. So we have a number of questions. I'm, I'm sorry, I can tell already we aren't going to get all through all of them, but. Um, I want to start with one from uh, Margaret uh, Daly Hayes, former 
uh, director of the, of the Perry Center. Um, and I'm going to read the question in, in its entirety. Uh, congratulations for taking the bold step. You are right. CDMA has lacked targets for implementation. What mechanism do you contemplate to foster cooperation and collaboration, parenthesis, the new C2? What concrete activities in between CDMA meetings? What what example of mechanisms do you offer? Mechanisms that aren't just uh, uh, exchange of ideas, but that help foster coordination and collaboration. Question, and Mr. Foreign Secretary, I don't know. Great question. No surprise. <laughs> Um, thanks very much for the compliments on our step of faith. Um, you know, I want to reflect on the observation made by Professor Betancourt with respect to the value of the process. And in fact, we have, as the pro tempore secretariat and the host nation, we, we have deliberately constrained ourselves in attempting to propose, suggest what the mechanism will be. We have faith that in this region there is enough capacity to reflect on a large body of practice and I was reminded of this during the break by, by Professor Cope uh, that there is a practice that has been occurring involving all the armed forces of the region when events occur, we practice somehow and respond. There's not the policy cover to support the practice, no. Bridging the practice as it is now, very ad hoc, with the new C2 that enables and, and, and conforms to the governance that the policy framework is intended to provide we think will emerge from the discussion that needs to begin. The challenge is that the discussion in this region has not begun. So we would like, at the end of the day, that in October 2016, the discussion to begin on what those mechanisms will be. Of course, we've been thinking we could propose some, but as the host nation, I think the the, the posture that we are adopting is let's include all of the region in the, in, in the dialogue as we arrive through that process of discussion that we will begin, we hope, at CDMA 12 on coming up with the mechanisms. And again, the mechanisms we refer to relate to the overarching policy to govern what happens. Out of that policy governance, the new C2 arrangements, the mechanisms will fall to align and connect with what's happening right now on the ground, where if there's an event right now, we'll get together and respond, but we do not respond with the assurance that there is a governance arrangement in place that sustains and ensures that when the event is not occurring, arrangements will still be standing by and therefore enable a more efficient and effective capacity to respond. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, this one is coming from Adam Isaacson from the Washington Office on Latin America. Uh, the question is, will Cuba be invited to participate in the 12th uh, CDMA? as several participating nations suggested last time. If I may, uh, the issue of Cuba has been something that we have been discussing. We have seen the recent softening of, of issues involving Cuba in the hemisphere. Uh, for this conference, we did indeed invite Cuba to be here. We haven't seen them. But I was telling someone earlier today that as soon as I get back to Port of Spain, the intention is to treat with the Cuban embassy in Port of Spain. In terms of participation in the CDMA, the 
regulations prescribe certain forms and norms that you go forward with. And while we will seek to probably have, in the first instance, Cuba be an observer in the process, we will have to treat with the member states in the hemisphere to, with regard to Cuban membership. It's, that's a bit more of a prolonged process. We in the Caribbean, we see great value from bringing Cuba into the fold. We have the very toll to avail ourselves of the tremendous experience and, cap and capacity, for example, that Cuba has in military health and in health as a whole. And we will want to be able to avail ourselves of that and other areas that will be developed. So yes, we will see what we can do to have Cuba be part of the process, but we know we also have to depend on the rest of the members with regard to moving forward with full membership. There's a process for that as well. Uh, here is one in Spanish from Gloria Polastri uh, from the mission, the permanent mission of Ecuador. And I'm going to try to just uh, uh, translate it on the fly, put it into English. Uh, considering that America has been declared a zone of peace and that the countries in the region have diverse forms and roles for forces and security forces, and that there exist uh, a number of other uh, fora uh, with, in which uh, themes uh, related to security are dealt with, um, uh, including several fora of the of the OA of the OAS. Uh, how do you see uh, the policy of uh, security and defense of the hemisphere in rela in relation to these other fora? Just this, before we take it to pass, probably just this morning we met with the Committee on, uh, on Hemispheric Security in the MS at the OAS. And that was indicative of the approach we are hoping to take in the next few months as we go, to, go towards the day 12. We intend to build bridges. We intend, as the, as the Vice Chief of Defense Staff had indicated in this presentation, there are several bases already there, but they have not been dealt with, they have not been treated with. And our intention is to find a mechanism to reactivate what was initially thought and put it into, into action. So this morning we met with the Committee on Hemispheric Security, and we note that, I think it's going to this week or next week, they will be treating with the issue of, of, of humanitarian assistance, emergency assistance at the OAS. So the, the, the discussions have begun, and the path has already been, been laid, but I leave it to my colleague to continue. Thank you very much, Permanent Secretary. Um, there are several, there's much that has been done in the hemisphere. It has not been coherently put together and organized into an integrated regional policy framework. That's what we need. So that statement, for instance, during the presentation in May 2005 was referring to, and in fact that was about 18 months after the, the adoption of the Declaration on Security in the Americas, that identified that there is a requirement for a single, I think it referred to a common policy. What we need to do now is integrate what's happening what's existing with what is required. Um, I was referring earlier today as well to the fact that CD, the Committee on Integrated Development, I don't remember the exact acronym, what it stands for, in the OAS is right now responding to a mandate from OAS General Assembly Resolution 2750 of 2012 working on a plan to advance the process for how we look at all the existing mechanisms, as it will audit all the existing mechanisms, and strengthen and improve how the region deals with disaster response. That is an important part of what we would like to see develop, but not the only element of it. There are other things happening in the region that need to be brought together through this process of discussion to frame and arrive at that comprehensive integrated 
overarching policy framework. Um, the discussion has to begin. There's a discussion, there are several discussions occurring at several different places that need to be brought together and give the governance that gives the C2 that is required. Thank you. Let me go to a question that comes from our online audience uh, in Jamaica. Um, in your view, what are some of the practical ways in which the military can support the police in the fight for public security? Thank you. Practical ways in which the military can support the police in respect of security, yes? yes. Um, our experience in Trinidad and Tobago, and I can speak only of our experience in Trinidad and Tobago, um, as far as the ways in which our military provides support to the police, embrace activities from as simple as um, joint operations, joint activities, joint patrols, and move to other areas that involves emergency assistance, for instance, when we have major events, support for major event security. Um, we also have in Trinidad Tobago what we call our energy sector security initiative, which is led largely by defense personnel that contributes to the security of our critical infrastructure, particularly as it relates to our oil and gas sector. These are some of the ways in which our military have been used to support the police that I can recall at this time. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Lucas Andrews. I, I, I just want to add as well, and I, the, I note the question is coming from Jamaica. So I'm going to refer to a strategy adopted by the heads of government in CARICOM, the CARICOM Crime and Security Strategy in February 2013. I think it was adopted in Port-au-Prince. There are 14 objectives in that strategy. And of those 14, seven speak directly to capabilities that exist within the military organizations in CARICOM. They include, one, Ms. Lucas Andrews referred to critical infrastructure protection. They refer to maritime security and surveillance. They refer to border security and surveillance. So, so those are some of the practical areas that we have to determine how we will um, create a more effective uh, interagency operational process. That's a sub-region, and it deals with not even humanitarian emergency assistance. So already we're beginning to see from the first theme that as we deal and start hopefully the discussion with humanitarian emergency assistance, there will be some kind of automatic areas beyond humanitarian emergency assistance that we may want to consider in the discussion for ensuring that we govern. We want to govern and control, make sure it doesn't happen on an ad hoc, um, unregulated manner. That type of strengthened interagency uh, cooperation between military and law enforcement. But again, those things will have to be governed at multiple levels. They will have to be governed at national level by the sovereign right and responsibility of member states to determine how they will employ their military and, and law enforcement organizations at the sub-regional level, as in the case of the CARICOM crime and security strategy. And at some point, we'll have to contemplate what the governance arrangements will be through policy at the regional or hemispheric level. Thanks very much. I just want to add as well, without Trinidad and Tobago, there's an indirect assistance to the police 
by way of our defense force treating with other elemental foundations, youth. We have programs in Port of Spain, in Trinidad and Tobago rather, they, that treat with getting some of the youth who may otherwise be engaged in other kinds of activity into programs. There's a particular program called the Civilian, Civilian Conservation Corps, where young people are brought together under the ages of professionals who were either in the military or still in the military to be guided. There's another program that we call MILAT. And these programs are meant to, bear, to steer youth into different directions, away from criminal activity. And that is a preventative measure that will impact on the police because then they will have less work to do if these youth don't get into activities that are nefarious. So now we have the other side of the coin. Here is a question coming, taking the same issue but coming from the opposite direction. Uh, it's coming from Argentina. Uh, I'm going to translate it. Um, it seems to me that the three, T, three uh, thematic axes are focused on the subsidiary role of the armed forces in questions of security or humanitarian assistance. Uh, since this is a conference of ministries of defense or capitals, uh, why don't you include at least one theme that is specific to defense? Uh, for example, cooperation to protect uh, maritime and airspace uh, that is uh, adjacent or, or shared. Thanks very much. That's, that's, that's an excellent question that, that provides much insight of the need for us to begin this discussion. Because immediately in the question, and, and I quite understand that the perspective of maritime surveillance and security being a defense mission or defense rule is held in some member states. In other member states, it is not seen as a pure defense rule. And therefore, we think that as we continue with this discussion, hopefully we would understand that we, we need to continue the redefinition of defense and security as it applies to our reality in this region. And we also need to continue to redefine what the role of the military will continue to evolve to be in that whole redefinition of the concept of security and defense, concepts of security and defense. We are at a good place. We are at the point where several things are happening in the environment. We need to have this discussion, come to clarity on the various plausible perspectives that are coming forward. But at the end of the day, as the question poses, how do we provide for collective action on a mission like that or cooperation to secure our, our space? Um, that discussion has to be undertaken as we go forward here. Um, the concern is that we cannot remain with different perspectives and not seek to put them together and create a new solution. This is where we are now. That's the leadership opportunity that CDMA has and we are proposing it should assume from the 12 CDMA. Thank you. Professor Ritzeport, I don't know if you'd like to comment on, on this as well. Well, just a, just a short comment. I, I don't see that the topics preclude the consideration of the defense or the military as the traditional defense issues. The first topic is, is, could be just about that. You're talking about the changing challenges or defense environment. Uh, and this would include the discussion on the evolving role of the military. So uh, evolving role meaning uh, how much we have to deal with the traditional role of the military, the new roles of the military, if there are drones, if there are uh, new uh, challenges for, I knew that there is a, a TPP just uh, uh, agreed at some point, at least of the, the agreement levels. Uh, this may change the demands in the security and, and particularly in the, 
in the navy, in the ocean environment in, in that re particular region in which the, the question is coming. And we'll demand from the armed forces in the region to, uh, as they usually do, to reassess the way they are addressing those demands, those security issues. So I, I don't really think, see that uh, we are precluding the, this discussion from, from the conference. It's in there. It, it's just the, the, the kind of interpretation. Uh, I think it's there. It's included. I'd like to add to, to what Professor Bettinkus said, we would know that what we have indicated is that these are our proposed themes. These are our proposed concepts. The purpose of this event and other events like this that would follow is to get the perspectives of member states in respect of what we are proposing. So in support of what Dr. Bettinkus said, in regard to the evolving role of the military. We take note of the comment made by the, Argent, the, the, the person from Argentina, and we would ensure that in respect of this particular team, we look at all aspects of the evolving role of the military, and not only the ones that were proposed or suggested in the, in the, in the presentation. Thank you. Um, Let's see, I've got a, a one that uh, is related to something that uh, uh, Professor Bittencourt uh, uh, alluded to. Will the CDMA be considering the emerging threats of technology seen in such things as the use of robots, drones, and other technology being used for ill deeds? As we discuss the evolving role, a lot of these themes will come to light. Indeed, just this morning, we were talking about as we go forward with the process, we'll have to start looking at the issue of microbiology as it relates to the defense force. We'll have to start looking at the issue of microtechnology as it relates to the defense force. And as we, we, we postulate in, in, as we, uh, in October, and as we discuss, all of these factors that treat with an emerging role of the military will be, will be dealt with. And certainly, some of these ideas will be, will be discussed because the military is evolving role, it includes some of these things. It has already begun to include some of these things. And indeed, the military has been a peer setter in many of these areas. A lot of the applications that are developed for the military find themselves into the commercial space. So we expect that the discussion would indeed involve some of these areas. Um, question from the uh, Perry Center faculty from Alejandro Aleman. Several years ago, uh, Trinidad and Tobago hosted a conference along with Southcom to address energy security, which could be uh, one more point to discuss under thematic axis two. Is, this an ev is there an evolved understanding at the regional or hemispheric level on what energy security means? And isn't this a very salient issue which could be addressed at a future CDMA. And I think this goes in part to the interpretation of energy security at large. Thanks very much for that question. Uh, so this, this particular topic will be covered under the first theme when we refer to critical infrastructure protection. Um, that conference back in 2007, I think it was, um, dealt with energy security from the perspective of the security for the energy, sec energy sector um, infrastructure, the security of the infrastructure. Of course, it was beyond the infrastructure. It is the whole issue of being able to ensure the sustainability of the supply and the availability and so on. So when we speak to in team, theme two, the environmental protection and resilience, there is in the discussion paper, which will go out I think in the next week or so, um, an avenue opened for more discussion on how we include issues of the combination of environmental protection and the implications for, for energy resilience for making sure that we could sustain um, the sources of energy over time. Um, you know, one of the things that occurs when you have massive deforestation 
and degradation of your forest areas is that you damage your, your water tables and you now begin to, to interfere with, with water supplies and so on. Now, if you have hydroelectric power um, as, a, as a key source of energy, then we need to begin to pay attention to the extent to which um, that is going to impact on the sustainability of that form of energy. The Energy Sector Security Initiative in Trinidad and Tobago, we will be presenting as a model on the infrastructure side. But we know that across the hemisphere, there are many views, experiences, there's expertise that could be shared. And so we would look forward to receiving those as we continue the discussion going forward. But thanks very much. I don't know if... I think we've, we've covered um, slightly more than half the questions, uh, but uh, we're, we're running out of time here, and I want to give our panelists uh, a chance to uh, make just a few uh, summary remarks. Um, I will make sure that the rest of the questions get to the panel uh, so that they're aware of uh, what kinds of things. But I think we've had a, a, a representative uh, sample. Much. I personally want to thank all of those in the audience and even those who are with us through electronic means for taking the time to listen to us uh, to try to understand what we intend to do uh, in the next few months and indeed to culminate in the conference in Port of Spain and to put into practice or to action afterwards. All I want to ask for is that new thinking to treat with new realities has to be the way forward. We cannot continue to have our minds cast somewhere that the rest of the world has gone past. And so the hemisphere, this hemisphere, has to catch up. This hemisphere has to be talking about collaboration and cooperation as the bedrock of our existence despite our differences. And for, the, for because there are areas that are important for our people that have nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with geography, nothing to do with economy. It's about safety and security. And so we ask that we look at harmony and diversity and we share our experiences because we, if we do not do that, we are destined to fail. I want to ask that those who have already sharpened their pencils and written their scripts, written their speeches, please assist us by re-examining those speeches and giving us a chance to come to the table but let us come up with a consensual position that is, a, that is for the benefit of all of peoples in the hemisphere. This is my plea. I thank you. Any other comments, other panelists? Uh, just let me add a quick one. I made my, my comments on the quite interesting panel we had based on the past, looking back. Let me make one short comment looking to the future. When I think about defense and your responsibility, practically everybody here who uh, has responsibility or have responsibility in the, the, with the defense have also responsibility to think about the future. We have responsibilities about the present, protecting sovereignty, protecting defense, each one according to the political culture of the, its own country. But every time that you think about the, the, the present, you are also with one eye in the future. You have to, to be prepared for the next challenge, for the next threat, for the threat in 10 years. How much time you need to develop the defense that will guarantee your sovereignty in 10, 20 years from now. So is, is this what I think should be the main motivator of this forthcoming 12th Conference of Minister of Defense? Let's think together about the future of this region and using this opportunity. Every time we think about the future, we think about the equipment, we think about new devices, we also take the risk of making our neighbors being more concerned about that. At the moment that you upgrade here, there is a perception of the other neighbor that uh, they need upgrade too. So to avoid this kind of uh, circular uh, reaction, uh, cooperative environments are ideal for that. And this is what we have today, and I think is what we have to preserve. But remember that our responsibility is with our future, and probably with the future of our children, too, is always depending on what
Please join me in thanking our panelists. I think it's been very good discussion.